was amazing. It went from Hawaii to New York. Wow. <laughs> That's very cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, my, uh, the Marsh King's Daughter published in 2017. So I had the initial tour. And then um, the following year, when it came out in paperback, I set up two tours of my own through Michigan's Upper Peninsula, where the, you know, the story takes place. Um, my publisher wouldn't send me there because there weren't enough people <laughs> and enough <laughs> stores to justify it. However, all of the events that I did, like at libraries and the couple of bookstores, were so well attended. And people said, you know, many of them said it was the first time that they had met an author in person because nobody, you know, went up in northern Michigan like that. So I found that it was really rewarding. I was really happy that I was able to do that. I, I think I drove, I visited 35 Michigan cities and I drove uh, 7,000 miles. <laughs> Wow, that is astounding. Well, if Northern Michigan is anything like um, the Marsh King's daughter, I can see why uh, it might have been the first time people had uh, been able to to greet a, an author in person. Yeah, with me, it was like uh, for, for the Ninja Daughter, I went to Hawaii for a pre-launch event. So I didn't even have books, right? I had, um, I had the ARC that I could read from and I had these book plates and they were really special because I stamped them with my personal ninja warrior chop, um, you know, which I got when I, you know, achieved a certain level of. Oh, she went mute. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh. Somehow everybody got muted. We can do it. <laughs> Oh. oh, I'll unmute myself. Oh, hi, Janet. Are you ready? <laughs> hey. <laughs> we're, just, um, we're just chatting. <laughs> yeah, just so you guys know, we're just starting. We're um, Thank you, Sue Trowbridge, who's allowing us to do this, and Joe Mallon today. Um, but in the meantime, we are letting people in through the room, and Tori and Karen are just chatting. So oh, please okay, continue Tori. to chat, which is just <laughs> like our regular uh, literary salons. This is exactly the way it would be. Um, so, uh, Valerie, mute. You need to mute. I need to mute. 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 Okay. <laughs> I'm not mute either. Please, everyone, mute. <laughs> I do a regular Zoom call with a group, and one person has like cockatoos or something like that, and, <laughs> and they are constantly shrieking. <laughs> ah. Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Oh, really? I wonder what they're saying. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so I think we are going to get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. I am uh, Janet Rudolph, and this is a Mystery Readers International Literary Salon, and it is our first Lit Salon online. So we uh, welcome you for those people I don't know, but those people I do know. I wish we could be here in person. I mean, the, the weather is clearing up, the smoke is diminished. Um, it's a lovely day. We could sit in the garden, but instead we're doing this virtually because of COVID-19. Um, so our two speakers today are um, Karen uh, Dion uh, is, and Karen is the USA Today and number one internationally bestseller author of uh, The Marsh King's Daughter, which was published by G.P. Putnam's. It has been published in 25 languages. Uh, 26, actually, other languages. Um, her next psychological suspense, The Wicked Sister, has just been published also from G.P. Putnam in the U.S. and Little Brown in the U.K. Uh, Karen enjoys nature photography and lives with her husband in Detroit's northern suburbs. Our other speaker today is Tori Eldridge. Tori is the author of The Ninja Daughter, nominated for the Anthony Lefty and McCavity Awards for the Best First Novel, and named one of the best mystery books of the year by the South Florida Sun Sentinel. The second book in her Lily Wong series, The Ninja's Blade, will release on September 1, but it is available for pre-order. Tori has short stories published in several anthologies and a narrative poem in the inaugural reboot of Weird Tales magazine. She holds a fifth degree black belt in, um, we need a mute there, um, a fifth degree black belt in Toshin Do Ninja, I'll let her talk about it, <laughs> and has traveled the U.S. teaching ninja arts and women's self-protection. So a little housekeeping before we start, please mute right now 
If you are not muted, there's someone on the screen not muted, and I don't know who that is. So make sure that you are muted. Um, we are recording, just so you know. Uh, we will be recording this. It will be available later, hopefully, on the website. Uh, I'm Janet Rudolph, if you don't know. Um, the format for our discussion today, hopefully, will be a dialogue between uh, Karen and Tori. I'm there for questions. If you do have a question, what I'd like you to do is put it in the chat. If you look below on your screen or depending on the format of your Zoom, you will see the chat. Um, we, we hope we have time at the end. If we do, then what we'll do is have people ask their questions. But I will probably ask the first few and I will give you credit for your question. So get those questions in the chat as soon as you can. So we have something to talk about. So without further ado, um, Karen, why don't you start something about maybe your new book? Sure, I'll tell you a little bit about my two psychological suspense. Um, the Marsh King's Daughter was my breakout book. It was the fourth novel that I pub uh, had published, but it just did spectacularly better than all of the others. My early novels were science-based thrillers similar to what Michael Crichton writes. And The Marsh King's Daughter is psychological suspense. I didn't set out to deliberately change the, the subgenre that I was writing in, but I happened to wake up in the middle of the night with the first sentences of The Marsh King's Daughter fully formed in my head. And the next morning I wrote up a few more paragraphs in the character's voice and that's the direction that my writing ended up going. The Marsh King's Daughter is set in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. And so is The Wicked Sister. And the reason that I have set my books there more recently is because I lived in the Upper Peninsula for 30 years. Um, beginning in the 1970s when my husband and I homesteaded in the Upper Peninsula with our infant daughter. So we lived in a tent, we, we built a little cabin, we carried water from a stream. I washed diapers by hand in a bucket. <laughs> as disgusting as wow. it's <laughs> So, <laughs> so, you know, in both my novels, I draw heavily on those experiences and, and my intimate knowledge of the, the natural world in the Upper Peninsula. So that's the long lead into The Wicked Sister. So in The Wicked Sister, it tells the story of a young woman named Rachel Cunningham, and she grows up in a beautiful, over-the-top log cabin hunting lodge on 4,000 pristine acres in Michigan's Upper Peninsula Wilderness. Her great-great-grandfather built the lodge and it's been in the family for generations. And it's, it's really luxurious. It has like a copper roof and stained glass windows and Tiffany lamps and, you know, probably first edition books, right? <laughs> all, all that really cool stuff. And her parents are wildlife biologists. So even as a toddler, she grows up following them around in the woods. Her father studies amphibians and her mother studies black bears. And Rachel develops a real affinity for the natural world. Um, she, she's a vegetarian from a young age. She won't even kill a mosquito unless she really has to, you know. So, and, and she especially loves black bears like her mother does so much that even when she's an adult, she feels like she can communicate with them on a deeper, almost a spiritual level. But the book does not open with Rachel happily following her parents around in the woods. Instead, she's in a mental hospital and she's been there for 15 years, essentially by her own choice, because she believes that she is responsible for the terrible shooting accident that took both her parents' lives when she was 11. And so she finds out fairly early on in the novel that she probably did not do this terrible thing. So she goes back to her childhood home where her sister and her aunt still live to try to figure out what really happened that day. So that's, that's the story of The Wicked Sister. Well, I've read it and it's great. And you did it again because The Marsh King's Daughter is one of my all time favorite psychological thrillers. And I've told you this before, and I'll keep telling people, you know, shouting it to the moon. I love that book. I love the characters. They're strong. They're powerful. There's uh, depth. There's such an incredible sense of place, both in The Marsh King's Daughter and The Wicked Sister, which of course, as you know, from the books I write, that's hugely important to me, that sense of place and 
and that interaction and that dynamic with relationships, because I think this is something you and I both have in common in the kinds of books that we like to write, the kind of books that we like to read. Um, we like the fast pace, we like the action, we like uh, the suspense, but we really like delving into those family dynamics. We like to um, you know, uh, really paint a visceral feeling of environment and scent and taste and emotion and things. And, and so I think that's probably why I loved your book so much. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and you know, the feeling is mutual. What, what I love and what we have in common besides what you uh, named is the fact that we're both drawing heavily on our own personal experience to write the books that we write. So tell us about Lily and about your experience. Yeah, I'd be happy to. It, I drew very heavily uh, from my experience, obviously. Um, if you don't know, Lily Wong is a Chinese Norwegian modern day ninja in Los Angeles with Joy Luck Club family issues. <laughs> and yeah, another one of those. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my father uh, was Norwegian from North Dakota, and my mother was Chinese Hawaiian from Maui. They met and married in Japan, where my sisters were born in Tokyo before they all moved to Honolulu and eventually had me. So these cultures, if we, if we take the Hawaiian out of the picture for a little moment, these three cultures, the Chinese, the Norwegian, and the Japanese are huge influences in my life, especially growing up in Hawaii, where, you know, multicultural is, is a huge thing. It's a wonderful place to grow up if you're a multicultural person. Let me tell you that, especially if you have, you know, these elements. So I wanted to, I wanted to share that because it's such an interesting family dynamic it it it, it creates such uh, conversation and culture and depth and things of course there's so much that we all have in common right families are families mother and daughters and you know mothers and and I mean daughters and fathers there are all those core similarities but you know the the cultural aspect just kind of makes it really kind of really neat in the same way that you brought in the uh, the upper Michigan, I found that so interesting. So I wanted to share that. So that was one thing I drew from my life. The other thing I drew from my life was a setting, of course. I've lived in Los Angeles now for 35 years and Lily is 25. She grew up in Arcadia, a very uh, Hong Kong immigrant rich um, neighborhood, you know, city in the county of Los Angeles. And uh, so there are a lot of places in Los Angeles that don't usually get seen and from a perspective that aren't usually told. And I, I really wanted to put that in. And then there's the third thing. Of course, there's the ninja factor, right? So <laughs> as, as Janet mentioned, I, I have a, a very extensive experience in martial arts. So um, I've been, uh, you know, fifth degree black belt in ninjutsu. I've been doing that a whole lot. But before that, I started in Tongsudo Karate and kickboxing and ground fighting. And uh, after uh, late in the ninjutsu training, my weapon of choice, my favorite weapon, because we use all sorts of weapons, so I have extensive training in that, are the long staff, the long weapons, the long spear. And so I had an opportunity to also train with a wushu master. And Lily Wong trained in martial arts since she was a little girl. And she trained in the Chinese martial art of wushu because that was acceptable. And she trained with this Japanese sensei in the park because she was 12 years old. He was a strange Japanese man and she didn't think her mother was going to approve. She was right. So, so those are the things that, that I draw from. Um, that's all, you know, backstory in the first book, Lily Wong. She's uh, helping out a woman, uh, a Ukrainian immigrant, trying to get out of a domestic violence situation that's not going over well, well, he's going back in, he's connected, he's, you know, not a good guy. But uh, she then um, 
tries and helps a cocktail waitress who's getting victim shamed in the public when the man who supposedly uh, attacked her is set free. And so in the first book, it's a complex mystery where she's trying to help these two women. She gets involved in the Ukrainian mob. She gets involved with, you know, sex traffickers and of course her parents, because uh, that's a huge thing. So that was the first book. I keep talking. I can tell you no, about no, the second. No, no. <laughs> But, but I, I feel like I said a whole lot for that little, that little so, moment. So I'm, I'm curious, like when you mentioned the Ukrainian mob and so forth, did you have to research all that? Please don't tell me you have firsthand experience with that too. No, thank goodness I did not. <laughs> um, most of the books that I write, because here's the thing, uh, the, the Ninja's Blade is coming out, that's book two. The Ninja Daughter was the first book. It was the first book published, but it wasn't the first book written. So I had at that time two books in submission, The Ninja Daughter and another book. And I had sequels to both of those completely outlined, chapter by chapter outlined and partially written. And I had started a fifth novel. So, so I can say that my pattern, because I think, you know, with five novels there, um, the pattern is that I begin with research. And from the research, I get interested and characters start to emerge and a premise starts to emerge. And that's then where I go for a hike and start thinking about it and let it all come together. And then comes the, the outlining and, and it expands and, and it becomes that sort of thing. So Ukrainian mob, yeah. Uh, with the Ninja Daughter, that was a little bit differently because it came from a stream of conscious short story and it emerged out of me. And then I had to research to support it. And so the gangs of Los Angeles, not just the Ukrainian uh, element, but also the Mexican street gangs, the sex trafficking, all of that had to be researched. With the second book, it began with a deep dive into the commercial sexual exploitation of youth in Los Angeles. And it was from there that all of the characters and the premise and the plot emerged. That's really interesting. My early novels, when I wrote the science-based thrillers, I started with the plot and then created characters to serve the plot. Hopefully, you know, interesting and engaging characters, but still I started with the, the plot, like a, a what if sort of situation. But as I mentioned, you know, for the Marsh King's daughter, I woke up in the night with the first sentences in my head. The sentences are, if I told you my mother's name, you'd recognize it right away. My mother was famous, though she never wanted to be. Hers wasn't the kind of fame anyone would wish for. J.C. Dugard, Amanda Berry, Elizabeth Smart, that kind of thing, though my mother was not of them. All of that was just poof in my head as I was sleeping. I wasn't dreaming about the character, they were just there. And then, as I mentioned, I, I explored the character further the next morning, writing up a little bit more of who she was, her telling me, because it's, it's first person. And what I think is really cool is that's the first page of the novel. So, you know, it just took off from there. So when it came time to write my next novel, The Wicked Sister, I again started with character. And, you know, I wasn't entirely sure what the plot was going to be. So I made a lot of false starts at the beginning, you know, because uh, <laughs> it, I wasn't happy with the direction that, that the book seemed to be going. But uh, my character of Rachel was inspired by something that I had read in the news a long time ago. And it always stuck with me. And this was um, an accidental shooting that involved a toddler. He was in the car, it strapped in his car seat behind his mother. He found a loaded handgun in her purse and he shot and killed her through the seat. Oh my gosh. I know, I know, it's, it's horrific. And the thing is, the thing that struck me and always stayed with me was one day that little boy was going to grow up. You know, inevitably he would find out what he did. And how would that change your perception of yourself? You know, we, we think, oh, I'm a good person. You know, I'm, I'm a this and I'm a that. And then what if you found out when you were 15 or, or 18 or 20 that you had done this terrible thing? And devastating, it, utterly yeah. devastating. Right. So, so the questions that I wanted to explore is how, do you, how does a person come to terms with that, you know, and still um, go <laughs> put one foot in front of the other, let's say, you know, so... The Wicked Sister began with character. That's, that's so interesting that yours is, starts with a piece of research. I do find that when I get stuck, you know, in writing, research is always the solution because when you're writing, you're just giving out what you already know 
But when you research something, you're taking in all that fresh information and it excites me and it gives me more ideas. Yeah, I, I love research too. I mean, I can get lost in it. I think a lot of writers can. Uh, it's interesting what you're saying that the, um, the big ex exception, you know, the, the character thing was the one with the Lily Wong series that came with Lily. You know, it's like, it was a stream of consciousness writing for a short story. And uh, I had her at a bar and this thing started to happen and it started to go in a very unusual way and uh, by the end of the scene it was a very shocking it was a very visceral emotional scene ended up being a pivotal scene in the ninja daughter and as soon as I wrote it I realized that the short story she was talking to somebody and relaying this thing and I knew who she was talking to and I knew that that was going to be the novel and that that scene of her being in that position with that person was going to open the book and so that was where that came from with the um you know I love how you were talking about um you know how would you deal with knowing this thing about yourself uh Lily is going through a bit of that herself at the end of the Ninja Daughter, without giving away any spoilers, I'll say it's a very, um, it's a very exciting ending. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, a lot of action, a lot going on in there. Um, and it involves uh, sex trafficking. I think I can put in that amount. So that's why I knew I wanted to dive back into there. So Lily, I mean, well, let me start with this. My feeling about violence um, in, in life, in literature, in movies, or whatever, it takes a toll. It should take a toll on the, on the people committing it, on the people suffering from it, on the people surrounding it. And so it bothers me in any kind of fiction or, you know, uh, movies or whatever, when people just go their merry way, you know, and they've, they've, They've exterminated all these people and they're fine. Um, Lily Wong is not that kind of a person. You know, she's 25. Uh, I chose that age for a very specific reason because it's a volatile time in our life. It's when we are so courageous, so uh, impetuous, and we believe that we can do everything, but we're also making the worst mistakes of our life in our 20s usually. <laughs> And, uh, you know, and we're still trying to figure out how are we supposed to be with our parents? You know, how does that work? You know, we were just a kid and we knew how that worked. And now we're like this adult thing. And, you know, there's all that kind of stuff going on. And by the way, did I mention that, you know, backstory, Lily's younger sister was raped and murdered when Lily was in her first year in college? Yeah, that was what, you know, motivated her to become a ninja protector, virtually a big sister to an entire city. So... In The Ninja's Blade, Lily is not just dealing with her grandparents coming in from Hong Kong for her mother's 50th birthday. Yeah, that's going to be a tense thing. But um, also there's a teenager who was uh, a prostituted youth who was rescued, who has now gone missing, and Lily has to hunt her down. And in addition to all this, Lily herself has been suffering some issues for the last month. She's having a lot of uh, PTSD type flashbacks and um, mood swings and things that that she's trying to cope with and other people's attitudes about that there's you know there's a lot of um, self-examination for uh, racial profiling and inequities and there are a lot of really deep themes in this book that are balanced with humor and heart and a whole lot of food so, yeah. But, and that's something I wanted to talk to you about because you go to some very dark places and yet you also manage to keep that, that warmth and that entertainment. Well, Is it conscious? Yeah, you know, it's a funny thing because I feel like the, the core themes that unite my two books are they tell the story of a young person who overcomes a tragedy, has to overcome a tragedy in their childhood 
to go forward, to make something of themselves. In the case of, of uh, Helena and the Marsh King's daughter, you know, she's the daughter of a kidnap victim and the man who took her, and she was raised in complete isolation for her first 12 years. You know, that's an odd upbringing for sure, even though she loved her upbringing. And it's the same with Rachel in the beginning of The Wicked Sister. She, she loves her childhood, and it's not till she does this, you know, this terrible thing, she thinks that, you know, all of that changes. Um, the book is told in two timelines, which I haven't had a chance to mention yet. And I think it's important because to me, it's what adds depth and meaning to the book. So besides Rachel's quest in the present to find out what really happened, there's a section I call them now and then. So I'm also writing from Rachel's mother's perspective in her first person voice in the past. Uh, to tell like the events that led to them moving to this remote piece of property. And um, obviously Rachel has a sister and <laughs> that's, that's not a giveaway with the title, the wicked sister. <laughs> and this child is a, is a difficult child from birth on. And they end up um, because of a couple of incidents moving to the upper peninsula. Her, her mother thinks that this will protect the child from others, protect others from the child, and so forth. And in that aspect, I'm also exploring something that um, touched me personally through friends of ours. So my husband and I, uh, friends adopted three siblings. And obviously these, these kids were coming from a difficult home. The younger two did really well in the new environment, but the oldest child just was they, they couldn't do anything with him. You know, they love them all. They wouldn't have adopted them. They weren't just fostering them, they adopted them. And, but he became like violent towards his younger brother and sister. And finally, when he was 12, they had to put him in an institution. And oh again, my. to me, that just really touched my heart. And I thought, well, that's like a Sophie's Choice sort of thing, right? And so I, I think about the process that led up to that. How at what point as a parent would you say, you know, because a parent loves their child, right? And and we deal with whatever we get <laughs> as far as, you know, <laughs> if our children are born with a birth defect or something, you know, we, we go forward from there. So, you know, if, you, if a child also has a psychological problem, um, you would work with it as long as you could. So that's what, to me, gives emotional depth to the story because, mm -hmm. you know, you've got Rachel in the present trying to find out what happened because she has fragmented memories because of the trauma of that day. And then I'm also showing the reader what happened, what led up to that moment. And so to me, the two stories balance each other out. And to your point, um, Tori, yeah, it is dark. <laughs> I don't know. I, I like, I like, Again, you know, it's not the focus on the darkness, but of people overcoming that. To me, yes. that's- Yes, yes, that's exactly the thing. I, I've had people ask me that before. They're like, oh, but you're such a cheerful person. Why do you write such dark things? And I'm like, well, but here's the thing. I feel like I'm writing about empowerment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and I think you too. I mean, if we have these characters who are finding this uh, empowered place inside them that are taking control of their lives as best they can and, you know, are out there doing these things. And of course, what makes a, you know, a story like that, a, an overcoming story, an empowerment story, even better is when the obstacle is huge or the villain is truly smart and deadly. That's true. That's all true. And I like to think that, you know, an author makes us, there's like a, a pact between the author and the reader. You know, it's like, as an author, we're asking readers to invest a certain amount of time in reading this story that we've, we've come up with, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I feel like in mysteries and thrillers, both there's, there's that promise that things will all work out in the end. You know, it's, it's kind of unstated. But it's like, hang with me. Yes, bad things are going to happen, but it'll be okay by the time you get to the end of the book. <laughs> yeah, I really agree with that. And I put Lily in some really dangerous situations. In fact, the beginning of The Ninja Daughter opens with her in a very dangerous situation. And I've had readers say, whoa, I was, you know, I was, really, I was really scared for her. And then I ask and I said, um, but did you also trust me? And they said, yeah, I did. I, I trusted you. And so, especially because I'm going into 
a lot of areas of like in the ninja's blade i'm you know it's the world of prostituted youth i mean so we have a lot of teenage characters they're i love them they're they're amazing characters they came out of the research in these these uh interviews that that i saw i discovered um this amazing nonprofit called Children of the Night. I encourage you to go look it up. And it was started, founded by Dr. Lois Lee, and she has been a champion for prostituted, uh, for com the commercially sexually exploited youth and children. And it was, it was quite an awakening for me and learning about this and hearing these stories. And from this, there were all of these kids that I was listening to the ways, the different ways in which they were lured, coerced, tricked, forced into this life and the different backgrounds. Um, this is not just one socioeconomic danger. This is a potential danger to all of our children. So in a sense, it's kind of a, you know, a cautionary tale. But I did want to use these characters to show these different um, ways in which kids are tied into this. And also, um, and this made the book really scary, I got to tell you, it made it really scary for me to write because I had to do a lot of research to this because it wasn't just my culture. Um, you know, I'm diving into all sorts of cultures in our city and I want to get that voice right and I want to do honor to that and I want to do justice to that. And so I, I had to do a tremendous amount of research uh, in the beginning, in the middle, at the end, I kept going back to it to get those voices right, to get those the, those stories right, to to tell them about it. Yeah, and I think it's important that you know, even though we're writing fiction, we can still shine a spotlight on a real world problem, which is you know, a person who reads your book is going to come away with a greater understanding of what it's like for kids to fall into that situation. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. And, and also, you know, it's an interesting thing um, in the ninja's blade. I mean, well, okay. So Lily, like I said, she's a biracial character and she's out there protecting a city in, in one of the most diverse cities in the world. And by the way, that's no accident because I look at Los Angeles as being a macrocosm of Lily's personality. So if Lily is pulled in three different cultures, Los Angeles is pulled in how many more, but it's the same kind of a thing. So there's that symbolism. There's a lot of symbolism that goes on in the book in subtle ways. Uh, they're like little Easter eggs, you know, that and a lot of, um, you know, um, ninja wisdom that comes through as Lily discovers it or her sensei imparts it, things like that. But yeah, I think it's, um, it, these, these issues, I think are really neat to kind of look at it. So in the ninja's blade, Lily gets called out on, uh, you know, some racial bias. And that's like, what? <laughs> and that was really important to me because I want to bring up this conversation, right? This is a very important conversation right now. And I feel like the, one of the most important things is to be able to check in with ourselves right? Uh, in the course of our lives and kind of look at how we're looking at things and how we did look at things and how we hope to look at things. And that introspection, I think is really important, you know, with how we, we uh, improve in the world and by, um, by extension, our impact on the world. So I figured what better way of opening up that um, invitation to uh, introspection than to have an empowered biracial champion of justice like Lily Wong question herself. Yeah, that's all very cool. That's really nice. And I had just one final thought on, on us writing dark topics. The thing is, it's like, um, there is a scene in the Marsh King's daughter that it, it makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I don't like it. <laughs> if you've read the book, you might know which, which scene I'm talking about. But um, so what happened is, Helena and the Marsh King's daughter, she grows up loving her father unconditionally. And so I knew from the beginning that she would leave the Marsh by her own choice because there's nothing heroic if she and her mother were just rescued in, and plucked out of the situation. She has to drive it, you know? Right. And so for her to willingly leave loving her father that much, um, she had to see him for what he really was, for the kind of person he really was. 
And it wouldn't be enough for someone to just tell her, oh, your father's a bad man. She had to see it in order to make that break. And so that's the, the section that I was like, ah, I kind of wrote myself into a corner, you know, if you want to think of it that way, because in order to be true to the story, I had to go in a place that, as I said, I myself am not comfortable with. And so that sometimes happens as you're writing, you realize that you're going maybe to a dark place, but hey, we chose to write this story, this character. And, you know, so you have to go there because if the writer won't go there, then the reader can't go there either. But I like to think that I handle all of the darkness with a very delicate touch. Most of it happens off screen and it's not, I, I, I certainly hope it's not gratuitous. <laughs> no, I, 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 I think you, you hit it spot on because of course I've read both of your books and, and I think you succeeded in that. And that's something that's also very important to me. Um, you know, I, I'm not into gratuitous violence. I mean, that's just, you know, that's, and which is kind of interesting, right? Because you think, you know, here I am, I, I spend so much time, or I used to spend so much time, I retired from martial arts uh, training and teaching about 10 years ago when I... Rats, I was hoping to see you do something. Oh! Well, yeah, uh, we're in your living room, we could, or in your office. <laughs> what? <No. laughs> um, I actually have, I'm sorry for interrupting for one moment. I want to make sure that everybody knows they can send a question in chat. Please send your questions. I have a few here now. Just saying. <laughs> do, do you want to ask them? I mean, I, um, I don't mind hearing them. No, no. I have, okay. well, I have my own questions first. <laughs> so here's my first question. Okay. So this one's for Karen. Well, it's for both of you. Um, series versus standalones. So you've mm -hmm. touched on it. Um, Karen, you're doing standalones. Tori, you're doing series for now. Um, so Karen, tell me, why did you choose this? Or did, was this a conscious choice? Well, the, the environmental thrillers could have been a series, but my publisher didn't want to follow through with it after the second book. So with The Marsh King's Daughter, um, I really felt that I had told Helena's complete story in that book. And fortunately, my editor agreed. So when we were looking at what would the next book be, um, my editor laid out four criteria that the two books should share. And that is that book two should be another psychological suspense. Uh, it should be the same or similar setting, Michigan's Upper Peninsula. It should have a fairy tale element because that's a, a huge part of the Marsh King's Daughter. It, it parallels the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale of the same name. And book two should have an intricate structure. So, you know, a past, present, woven together, flashbacks, the whole whole nine yards. And I was really happy that he named those last two because those were two of the elements that I was most proud of in The Marsh King's Daughter. So, um, yeah, it's, it's the same sort of thing. I feel like I've, I've told Rachel's story. I don't know. I think it's a character flaw that I am very easily bored. And I just can't imagine myself <laughs> writing the same character book after book after book. It's like, let's start fresh. <laughs> I have been with my husband for 48 years, though, so, you know. Okay. <laughs> oh, you've got me beat. I'm only at, what, 32? <laughs> Which I thought was pretty good for a Hollywood marriage, you know. Uh, hey, uh, that's really interesting what you were saying. I find that fascinating that your editor had all of that input right at the beginning. Uh, that's That's a very... That's a new thing for me. Um, when I got the book deal for The Ninja Daughter, it was a two book deal. And I had given myself a head start because I am not a very fast writer. Newsflash. I'm not one of those people who just, you know, oh, I sit down and thousands of words come out in a day. I write every day. I write a very big day. I mean, I, I work six days a week, sometimes seven days a week, anywhere from six to 10 hours a day. So, you know, I'm always working, but no matter how long I spend on writing, you know, I don't get these 7,000 word days. Uh, sometimes I'm happy with 500. <laughs> I got, I got to say. Um, so I know this about myself, you know, now that said, when I do the first draft, it's pretty clean. And then I go back and I do a whole bunch of editing and it becomes cleaner still. And by the time I turn it into an editor, they're like, 
I love you. And then they have lots of, you know, other things that just take it to a whole other level. But I think uh, as far as first drafts go, I've been told mine are, are very clean. And it probably has something to do with the process of um, going through the the outlining and the the chapter by chapter summaries and then and then when I write it can all fly out the window at any moment and then once I actually start writing new things are discovered and so each stage is very uh, creative and stimulating but I got my start in writing with screenplays mm -hmm. and so my uh, my method is very similar to how I used to write screenplays. It's also the way I keep that fast paced motion going, even though I'm balancing, you know, family and sometimes even romance and culture and all these other things. But back to the whole series and the thing that I wanted to talk about was when I got the deal, so it was for a two book deal, I already had the second book completely laid out chapter by chapter summary and half of it written. Uh, so I had, I mean, what was written wasn't good, but uh, well, no, it wasn't half of it, uh, uh, seven chapters of it. So I had a head start um, and that was really great. Otherwise, I think I would have freaked out when they said, by the way, you owe us the next manuscript right. in a year. There's a lot of pressure there, but I want to know, so like a series character, mm. are you going to age her? Is, do you have in mind like an overall character arc over the course of the series? Like she's here now, she'll get to here by the end, or do you just plan on letting the events in the books d develop and shape her character? Yeah. Um, so with this book, it's not so much like a, a three book series or a six book series or, or whatever. So it's open-ended. Um, I'm happy to write it as long as I'm happy writing it and people are happy reading it. So at the moment, I'm writing the third book now. And the third book takes place, I believe, three weeks after the second book that takes place one month after the first book. Okay, then you don't have to age her. You can write a lot of books if you go at that rate. <laughs> exactly. Now, that said, nothing says I can't jump a year if mm -hmm. I want to. Um, but it's kind of interesting, um, doing it that way. But, you know, again, I put her at a volatile age. So she's 25. People change a lot between 25 and 26, between 26 and 27. I think probably a lot more than they do between say 48 and 49, uh, you know, or, or 56 and 57. Uh, it's not as, as earth shattering as somebody who's in those early 20s, making these discoveries about themselves, defining themselves, defining their relationships. That's a huge character arc with uh, these books is Lily and her mother, Lily and her father. Um, you know, at the beginning of The Ninja Daughter, both of them are ignorant as to what they do. And all of them are suffering some element of grief for mm -hmm. what transpired seven years before. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing questions pop up in the chat. Uh, <laughs> Good, you see them. Okay, yeah. so we're going to do um, this question from Corona for Karen. Uh, going forward, do you plan to go back to science-based novels or are you going to stay with the psychological thrillers? Thanks for the question. I am definitely going to stay with psychological thrillers. I think this is my personal author strong suit. <laughs> um, basically, I'm writing the kind of books that I should have been writing all along. And I do think it's interesting because in my second science-based thriller, um, it was the kind of book that followed four characters' journeys to, and then they came together at the end of the book in the caldera of an erupting volcano, because like I said, I like noisy things. <laughs> but at the same time, I deliberately set it up to where each of these four main characters by the end of the book would have to make a decision between a principle that they believed in and someone they care about. So you can see the psychological overtones even then. So yeah, going forward, it's definitely going to be psychological suspense. And my next book does not, like the first book had a raging narcissist. The second one has a psychopath. The third one, it's going to be normal people, I promise. <laughs> it's not going to be. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> so here's another question for both of you. Um, it has to do with a pandemic. L.J. Roberts asked the question, how will you handle the pandemic in the upcoming books? And Ron Katz says, 
the pandemic has created a radically new situation. Will you be referencing that in works you're writing or are you going to ignore it? So basically everyone is concerned. So um, Karen, you wanna take that one first? Yeah, at this point I'm planning to ignore it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, I think like for instance, I write contemporary fiction. So it's what's happening in the moment at that time. And um, hopefully by the time the next book is finished and published, we're not still doing this lockdown thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, really. so this is gonna pass. And it's like, I might reference it in the sense that like, for instance, um, I've got a past, I've got a history. You know, I homesteaded as part of the Back to the Land movement. And, and I did, I went to some protests in, in Washington DC for Nixon's inauguration a long time ago, <laughs> right? So, so, I mean, that's a part of me. And if it's a, important to the book, to the characters in the book, I will bring some of that forward, and which certainly could include the pandemic. But I'm not going to write it certainly as if it's ongoing. And I'll only put it in if it somehow serves the story. Well, I had a completely different experience, you see. Um, when the pandemic hit, I had gone back to that fifth novel I told you about. So before, just before when I got the uh, news that Lily Wong and was going to get picked up, I was halfway through writing a dystopian thriller set in an antimicrobial resistant future. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So... I had been wanting to get back to this book. It was such an exciting book. I really loved it. It, it wasn't about a pandemic, but because you were in an antimicrobial resistant future, it had changed society. Think Handmaiden's Tale, the way that changed society. It had changed society. And so that's what you were living, uh, living with. So I, uh, it took me, um, over a year to get back to it because I had to finish up the second Lily Wong book before I could get back to this fifth standalone. And so when I went back to it, it was January. So here I am writing this book and stuff is happening. And I felt like uh, that, that movie where Emma Thompson is writing and Will Ferrell is, is, is living and everything is happening to him. I felt like I was writing things and things were happening in the, in the world. And it was really freaky. And I ripped through that book. I had to get through it as fast as possible. It's more of an action conspiracy, really, than it is, you know, it, like I said, it doesn't, it's not a pandemic book. It's just the, the setting of it. And so now, you know, my literary agent has the uh, job of trying to sell it during this time, which is interesting. Uh, as far as Lily Wong, the third Lily Wong book is set at the height of the 2019 Hong Kong protests. Now, if you've been watching international news, you know where a lot of this has gone and what Hong Kong is now dealing with and their protests in 2020. But I have the benefit of setting this book in September 2019. So I have intertwined her adventure into real life current events and things that happened in the protesting. And so I will continue to, because I like this entwining fact and fiction. I do it in The Ninja Daughter. I did it in The Ninja's Blade, most certainly. And I'm definitely doing it in the, in the third Lily Wong book. And so whatever the fourth Lily Wong book uh, will be, I will be doing that too, but it will probably be in, excuse me, in 2019. So I won't need to deal with the pandemic. So, you know, uh, I, I don't know if I will ever take Lily Wong into January, 2020. We'll see. Um, we have a question that Andrew Ball asked early on. Um, I'm going to answer it, Andrew. <laughs> uh, he's asking Tori how the Anthony Awards uh, went. Well, they haven't done, they're not done yet. Just so you know, the Anthony's, well, they may have been recording some of the winner's speeches, but those would be the only people who know who won. The Anthony Awards are given by uh, BoucherCon, the World Mystery Convention. A little plug, it's going virtual. We hope you all attend. It will not be in Sacramento, but it will be on your computer or your phone or your tablet. Um, so uh, you are, Tori is nominated for an Anthony Award for Best First. Yay! Yay! Thank and, you. Um, 
all of that will be revealed <laughs> in October at Virtual VoucherCon. So I hope that answers your question, Andrew. And Tori, even if you do know, because I don't know. I don't. No, <laughs> none of us know. know. Oh, good. Yeah, no, but, we're yeah. actually going to try and do it live, you know. Oh, but, are they? Oh, good. Yeah, they, we better. just recorded stuff for insurance in case something happens with the internet or, you know, overloads or something crashes. Exactly. Or, but nobody but, knows. Well, you're also nominated for a McCavity. And um, we have recorded the McCavity Awards, but not the winners, right? <laughs> the nominations, we've done the speech uh, just oh because they wanted to get it in, but not the speeches because obviously that hasn't happened yet because I'm not telling. Um, so we're like doing it that way. <laughs> I didn't even know anything was recorded. That's very exciting. That's, I think uh, all of the awards a little nerve -wracking. that are going to be at opening reception have been recorded, but that's enough. Sorry, don't mean to take away from this. When um, is that airing? Uh, at at, uh, at BoucherCon in oh. October. It will, it's just done in advance so it could be done professionally and look good, I think. Um, oh we'll see if it is. Well, um, I couple, could, if I yes. could mention just for awards, I know like the Thriller Awards went online and everything went online. And it's so, I, I did have a McCavity nomination <laughs> for Marsh King <laughs> and um, the Barry nomination, which I, I won. And it was so amazing to, to go up in front of that room full of people and, you know, give your short acceptance speech. And so, you know, I really feel for the ones that are doing it virtual. So everybody attend, cheer them on, you know, they need that big crowd. <laughs> I appreciate that. When we went into California lockdown, I was at the Lefty Awards and I was nominated for Lefty Award. And we, it was in the first day. So I got to meet with some readers at this little uh, tea that I, I, I put together a tea and that was really fun. I got to talk to a lot of people, but all of my uh, panels were on the following day and I was co-hosting a banquet table with the amazing Tracy Clark and we were going to have loads of fun with readers and everything, but we never got to do that because it, it closed down the first day. So, oh well. <laughs> well, one more thing about awards. Remember uh, everyone who's watching, this is a very casual event. Our literary salons are not formal. This is not something, it may be on the website, but it's, it, but we're getting a lot of information, which we always do. Um, the awards for the lefties, the lefties yesterday announced, uh, I'm sorry, the Left Coast Crime announced yesterday that Albuquerque will be postponed from 2021 to 2022. But that doesn't mean that we don't care about the authors who wrote books in 2019 and, and would be get, or 2020 and would be getting credit in, in and, and awards in 2021. So there will be a voting nominations and voting for the lefties for this year, for 2020 in 2021. So just know that we have not forgotten people. I'm on that committee so I can say that we, uh -huh. I'm a we. <laughs> uh, we wanna make sure everybody gets that recognition that can't be postponed really for a year. Yeah. Um, but we are taking our guests of honor and moving them to the following year. <laughs> so that's fine. Yeah, that's lovely. Um, well, you know, speaking as an author, so my novel, The Marsh King's Daughter, as, as was mentioned at the beginning, it, it sold, uh, it's been translated into, you know, quite a few languages, and it was a bestseller in Germany and Sweden and Iceland, and that was all super exciting. But as an author, as a craftsperson, it, the awards mean so much to be nominated for an award because that means that your peers recognize the quality of what you wrote because let's face it a book can be a bestseller and not be a very good book right it happens <laughs> but if your book has nominated for an award that's that's something that an author just carries with them forever whether you win the award or not you know it's it's like yes um i i i wrote a good book and my peers recognize that. So I'm really happy to hear that the awards, you know, are going to continue no matter whether we can meet together in person or not. Let's just hope we do meet together sometime. I know. In the future. Um, so it would be a, fun. <laughs> um, I have a question uh, uh, to, uh, to Karen about fairy tales. I know we're nearing the end. This is probably late to do this. Um, but I really have a question about your about fairy tales in your books. Um, how did you, did you make a conscious decision to do that or did they? I did. Yes. So I woke up in the night for the Marsh King's daughter with the character talking to me. The next morning I wrote up some 
paragraphs in her voice and I set the book in the area that I knew well, Michigan's Upper Peninsula. But at that point, even though she kept talking to me and I kept writing little snippets in her voice in the following days, I didn't have a story. I had no idea what was going to happen to the character. So it was at that point that I got my childhood books of fairy tales off the shelf. These books right here, <laughs> Hans Christian Andersen and the Brothers Grimm. <laughs> and I started paging through to see if there was a fairy tale that I could use to structure my story. And the reason I did that is because there was a book that I was aware of. It's called The Snow Child by Eowyn Ivy. It's a beautiful book and it parallels, it takes place in 1920s Alaska, but it parallels the fairy tale, The Snow Child. And I was hyper aware of Eowyn's book because she and I have the same literary agent. So I thought, well, maybe there's a fairy tale that I can, you know, use to roughly structure my story. I started paging through and when I found the fairy tale, The Marsh King's Daughter, I was, I was just astonished at how well it fit. Because in the fairy tale, Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tale, The Marsh King's Daughter, the main character is the daughter of a beautiful Egyptian princess and the evil Marsh King who takes her. And the character who came to me in the night was the daughter of a kidnapped victim and the man who took her. Um, I had set my book in Michigan's far north. The fairy tale takes place in Viking country in the north. <laughs> and, you know, I had set mine on a ridge, cab in a cabin on a ridge surrounded by swamp or marsh. And again, you know, the marsh king's daughter. And the fairy tale is all about the struggle of good and bad within us. So in the fairy tale, the main character is, by day, she's beautiful like her mother, but she has her father's wicked wild temper. And then at night that flips and she takes on her mother's gentle nature in the guise of a hideous frog. So again, you know, it's that push pull, good and evil, which are you going to turn out to be? And my character, Helena, genetically, she's half her mother, half her father. So again, you know, what is she going to turn out to be? So having, you know, structured the story, called it The Marsh King's Daughter, there are excerpts from the fairy tale. Um, my challenge for the Wicked Sister was to find a way to incorporate that fairy tale element without just making a copy of what I did with The Marsh King's Daughter. And so I don't follow any one particular fairy tale. I use elements from several Grimm's fairy tales. Plus the setting as I described it, you know, this beautiful hunting lodge in the middle of a forest, that's like um, a castle in a forest for, from a fairy tale trump, trope, right? And so also like there are rival sisters like in Cinderella and her stepsisters. And my main character, she thinks she can talk and communicate with animals. That's no big secret. It comes out in the first page. And let's face it, fairy tales are full of talking animals, right? <laughs> so I wanted to give the whole book kind of a fairy tale, overall fairy tale vibe, as if, almost as if it itself is a fairy tale. So that's how that happened. Will there be a fairy tale element in the book I'm working on now? No. Because <laughs> I don't. Oh, really? Well, I don't want to forever be slotted as, oh, that's that author that always has fairy tales in their books. I think that would be too limiting. But That's we'll interesting. See, your editor hasn't given you that task uh, the way they did for the second book. They haven't laid out the kind of elements they want for no, a third book. I'm not, a, I, I'm not under contract. And I think he ah. trusts me enough now to write the book of my heart, to write the book that I want to write. And I, I, I think he's going to love it. There's so many elements to it that do make it intricate and complicated and you know it's got a, a piece that's sort of like the fairy tale but not really it, it, I, if it comes out of my head the way the way I see it in my head if it comes out on the page that way it's going to be really cool oh I'm so glad I'm glad to hear that and I I love the parallels between uh the fairy tales that you're putting in there because again for me that's like an element of symbolism you know something that's reflecting it and that was something that um I did repeatedly uh, in both of the Lily Wong novels. Um, there, there are these bits of, you know, empowering ninja wisdom, these, these moments of things that are then reflected in what's happening um, in the actual mystery or the adventure or whatever's happening in there. And the parallels of what's happening in her family with what's happening um, with these kids that she's in the ninja's blade that she's trying to hunt down and she's trying to to help and and save them and her interactions her 
complicated interactions with law enforcement and, and all these different things. And, and I, I like that. I like that when life to me, I don't know, maybe it's that Chinese element in me too. I do tend to see signs. I do tend to see symbolisms in, in things. And so it's not surprising, I suppose, that Lily Wong does too, right? Mm -hmm. um, so one more question. Uh, question <laughs> off the wall. No, uh, one more question about uh, movies. I know, uh, Karen, The Marsh King's Daughter was optioned. Is it still under option? It is, thank goodness, because, you know, Hollywood's on pause right now, <laughs> pause, and the option was up in June, but um, the production company that holds the option, you know, wanted to extend the option, so The Marsh King's Daughter is still very much on their radar. We've, we've got the script, we've got, um, we've had four directors and two main stars attached to the project, which I'm told is normal. But, you know, the current star, she's been signed on for a year now. And so, you know, I like to think that as soon as Hollywood opens up again and starts filming and people are able to do this safely, because that's the thing that matters, of course. Yeah. And it's going to be called The Marsh King's Daughter, which... Oh, yay! <laughs> excellent. Excellent. And by the way, yeah, that is, that is definitely exactly how things go. My husband is a television film producer. He did the Equalizer movies, one and two. And uh, way back uh, before then, he has a, another project um, uh, called The War Magician that's uh, in pre-development, I guess you would say, with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch to produce and, and co to co-produce and star. But that project before was uh, locked in with Tom Cruise back when he had Cruise Wagner and was part of Paramount. And this was before the, the split, you know, so you can have something that seems like it's a done deal, you know, uncork the, you know, the champagne and then Seven years after that, it all, you know, filtered down. Even the Equalizer, it had gone through different places, different stars, different, like you said. Um, I have watched over a million dollars spent, not out of our pocket, you know, out of a studio <laughs> pocket, <laughs> uh, you know, to hire a, a director or a writer. And then they, they changed their mind and go, yeah, it didn't really work for me. So, Tori, uh, what do you think? Um, any interest in the ninja's daughter? Well, the Lily Wong series is very suited to television uh, in my in my mind and, and also in my husband's mind. I mean, it could be a, a movie, but it's more suited for television because it's really character driven. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those stories where Lily and her 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 family, her parents, her mischievous grandparents in Hong Kong, yeah, they're a thing, her, you know, grandparents in North Dakota, but also the women's shelter that she works with, there's this, this women's shelter in Culver City, it's fictional, it's out of my head, but it's run by this amazing couple, Stan Reiner and Alicia Reiner, and Alicia's from Compton, and Stan's uh, from New York, and, and they have this, this fabulous women's shelter, and that's, you know, who hires Lily, and so there are all these just really neat characters, and those are the ongoing characters, that's not even, you know, the... Um, the other characters like J Tran and everybody who, who comes in. And so that's really what you want in a television series. You want a show where people tune in, sure, to see what's going to happen and, and to, you know, get through the excitement stuff, but because you want to spend time with them, right? You want to be with those people. And so, yeah, um, it's, it's in the hands of some pretty fun places. Uh, I can't talk about that now, but that's, that's always exciting. So well, I don't know, fingers cool crossed. You have an in already. <laughs> I, <don't laughs> mean, you know. I, I, I do, and it's, yeah. it's a lot easier to shop a thing when you have a producer shopping it rather mm -hmm. than if you have right. um, an entertainment uh, agent uh, shopping it. If you if you all don't know, and if you're interested in this process, a producer is an element. Uh, an agent is not. <laughs> uh, you know, an agent is representing you and knocking on doors and trying to get people like producers uh, interested in it. Um, they're they're trying to set up meetings with independent producers, with production companies, with stars, with directors, with writers, with studios. That's what an entertainment um, agent is trying to set up. Uh, a producer like my husband 
you know, he already has meetings, you know, with the head of this and the head of that or whatever about this project or that project. And then, you know, um, there's my project, you know, so there's always that ability to be in the right place, hearing what somebody is looking for and saying, oh, I have one of those. I have this kind of a thing. And yeah. so that's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. I will say that while the uh, television film business is on hold for production, um, there are things in production, just not here in the United States, and certainly not here in, in Los Angeles at the moment, but there will be, hopefully. There are a lot of meetings going on, mm -hmm. a lot of meetings going on. So yeah, that's good. interesting. Well, well and, and the difference of what you were saying between an agent and the producer, um, I talked to one of my directors by phone. Uh, he wanted to, which was cool. And he was British. So that was cool because I love that accent. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> But, but he told me that he, over a year period, had looked at maybe a hundred scripts before he found one that he wanted to work on, which was The Marsh King's Daughter. And so I thought that was really interesting, you know, to think that, I mean, it, I'm just agog to the idea that I could write a story that could even be translated to film, let alone that these talented people who have, could have their choice of projects want to bring my story to the screen. It, it really is amazing. Uh, the, the odds of getting a book traditionally published are, are very difficult, but the odds of getting a book produced are like, forget about it. So that is huge. That is really huge that, that your option. Let me ask you, is the director the first element brought into this deal? And then, because sometimes if, if you get a, an element, um, a director or say a showrunner for television interested, they usually have a first look deal with a studio and they can, they can go to the studio and say, hey, I found the next project I want to do. Mm -hmm. And the studio will then consider it and it will be higher on their list. So was that director the first element brought on or after? I don't think so. Um, ah. Because uh, The Marsh King's Daughter was optioned by a production company, Anonymous Con, ah. And they're responsible for the movie Spotlight and The Revenant. And so the screenwriter for The Revenant adapted the book. And I did talk to him by phone before we signed any paperwork because my agent wanted to be sure that we were on the same page. I have no say on what they do with the film. You guys probably know that. But, you know, I'm, I'm not worried because, again, I know that they're trying to make an Oscar-worthy movie out of it. Okay, do your thing, you know. I'll, I'll be hands off. So, so then we had the script. And then... Um, Let's see, it, the director was next. Um, Morton Tildum came on next. And this was fun. I was at VoucherCon in Toronto and um, my publisher had a dinner for some of their authors. So I'm sitting next to my editor, checking my messages because I'm compulsive about that. And I got, I got an email from my agent saying that Morton Tildum you know, had, was attached to direct. And so I just sort of pushed my phone next to, to, to uh, in front of my editor so he could see it and we're like, Yes. <laughs> and at that time, it hadn't been officially announced. So, you know, we had to be on the QT with it. It was announced the next February. So that's why I'm, I'm comfortable saying it here. He's no longer on the project. <laughs> oh. And neither is Alicia Pan, who was announced as being the actress. I have no idea why they've dropped off. But um, the, the main um, producer is Black Bear Pictures. They're, they're the ones that are financing the project. And so... Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just sit back and wait and see what happens. I really, really, really want to go on set if it gets right. and to the Academy Awards. Well, that too, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go out in the woods <laughs> where they're filming. <laughs> I think on that note, we do need to wrap up. Um, I have a couple. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you both so much for such a wonderful afternoon, such a wonderful meeting. Uh, one thing I usually do is give you, because um, you would have been here real time, so I would have been giving you chocolate. And Aww. unfortunately, I know, I know a lot of chocolate, because most of you know I'm into chocolate. So I will send you some chocolate. So awesome. do send me your address or wherever you want it received so you have some chocolate. Hopefully it will not melt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll have to think about that. We may have to wait. <laughs> um, but I want to thank you, and I want to thank the people that came today. Um, also, very much. This was wonderful. This was a terrific time. Please, everyone who uh, was, was here in real time, since this is being taped, um, if you were here in real time, 
please send me what you think. And if you would uh, like to be more interactive, which we usually are, uh, that would be great. But I think thank you very much for uh, sending your questions in chat and for coming. And to the two of you, I can't wait to read even your, I've read both of your second book, you know, the seconds, but I can't wait to read the future book. So thank you for telling us about those as well. Um, any last minute comments that you would like to make? I just want to thank all you readers so much. You know, it's a privilege to be a writer and to, to make your living as a writer. That doesn't happen very often. But I spent all my time as a typewriter writing these words. And it would mean nothing if people didn't read the books. So, you know, thank you for taking time today to come and listen to us talk a little bit about books and writing. And thank you for reading not just our books, but all books. And and I also want to make a little plug to, to help out and buy, if you can buy books, buy from independent bookstores, if at all possible. Because um, right now, the way the situation is, a lot of them are really struggling and they need our support. We want them to be there when this is all over. Yeah, I, I double that. Uh, one of my greatest joys in being a published novelist is actually interacting with people. Isn't that interesting? But that has been a huge joy for me in person and also virtually. So I really appreciate you guys showing up and being here because I really enjoy this and it really makes it feel personal and it makes it feel fun. And at the end of the day, that's what I want to do with my life, right? I want to spend my time doing things that are enjoyable and feel worthwhile. So thank you very much for helping make that be true. Thank you both very much. And thank you, uh, attendees. Um, hope to see you at our next event. Um, stay well, be safe, and we will see you next time. I'm gonna end the meeting. Thank you. Bye all, goodbye, thank you.